Good morning, everyone. Um, what an exciting theme we're going to be discussing today together. Oh, by the way, Daniela Bass. Yes. Um, just wanted to make sure that I still remember my name. I'm doing so many things lately that I'm getting confused a little bit, plus ages, so you can imagine. Uh, no, so Daniela Bass. I'm the director of the Division for Inclusive Social Development in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. It's a beautiful department because it deals, as I said, with affairs that are related to the economy aspects of our lives, the social aspects of our lives, but also to the environmental dimension. Uh, depending on the environment where we live, our quality of life can be improved or not. And when I say environment, uh, I'm not referring mainly to nature or climate, but I, I re I'm referring to the family environment, working environment. Uh, when we th think about rural areas or urban areas, those are also environments where we spend the most of the time of our lives, and so on and so forth. So what happens when, for various reasons, we could find out that we are not able to afford the paying the rent? temporarily or for a much longer period of time. And what happens if after a while we cannot not only afford to pay the rent, not even finding people who might support us and give us a, a loan or something, and we end up not being able to support neither ourselves nor our children if we have any children or relatives or parents or so therefore the family as a whole, and we end up becoming homeless. And what are the reasons why we become homeless? Or what are the reasons that make difficult to find enough money to pay the rent? So these are some of the questions I would like to discuss with you today. And I'm very proud that the United Nations decided to face this issue for the very first time in 75 years. So the role we have here today, not just us speakers, but all those of you who are attending this event, is to really share not only ideas, but good practices. And, uh, and from your different viewpoints, the division I lead for the department, for the whole United Nations system, is the focal point on youth globally on older people globally, indigenous peoples globally. What about their environments? When we destroy forests, for instance, where many indigenous tribes are still living, they become homeless. There are many ways of looking at homeless. It's not just a building made with bricks. And what about persons with disabilities? Why? Many of them are homeless, particularly in countries that are still developing, if you wish, or they are, that are still developing social protection floors. So that's another issue we have to look at. Social protection floors allow people to find ways and means to be able either to afford paying the rent and or not to become homeless. Yes, there are a few people who decide to be homeless, or clochard, as you say in French. That's a different story. It is their choice, and that has to be respected. But there aren't those many. Uh, the division is also, as I said, the focal point on persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, youth, older persons, the family, where all these different generations meet, as well as cooperatives that are social enterprises. And social enterprises can play an amazing role in providing the kind of support needed to find solutions not to become homeless or to find homes, dignifying homes uh, and dignified homes that allows us to pay for the rent. Now, before I move to our uh, speakers, I would like, I ask myself, okay, why, what could, in my case, uh, cause me not to be able to afford paying the rent. I started from there. Well, 
if I wouldn't have had the privilege to get a, a proper education and, and to keep updating my knowledge, life learning process, uh, maybe I would become either, I, it would be very difficult, difficult for me to find a job, A, not really because I'm a woman, but in some countries it might be, uh, but in my case because of my disability because most infrastructures are not accessible, are not inclusive. So even though I might be offered a job, I might not be able to accept that job because I want to be able to go to work, either because transportation is not accessible or the building where the job is is not accessible. And I'm talking out, speaking out here out of experience, okay? It's not theory in my case. I became paraplegic when I was a six years old and since then I have been using the wheelchair. So from attending school, Oh, to find a job, it has been a challenge. But we are tough cookies, aren't we, Victor? <laughs> so, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that there are many reasons why, or health-wise, if we are not able to earn enough money to pay for a private insurance, health insurance, or if we, if we do not live in a country that provides um, health insurance, to all citizens, you know, depending where you live, there are different roles, rules, and regulations. Then what happens to our health? We become sick, we're not able to go to work, we can't earn the money, we cannot pay the rent. And then if the sickness becomes even more serious, and it is maybe a kind of a mental sickness or something that affects our um, behavior and mental health, it might be that we end up on the street because nobody's going to take care of us. So forget about uh, renting the, b being able to rent an affordable house. You become homeless. What if you are an adolescent who is an orphan and lives in an institution until the age of 18 or 20 or 21, depending on the country, and there is no safety network waiting for you once the doors of that institution open, you get out. You're 18, you have no education, no family, no social uh, assistance, nothing. What do you do? I ask myself this question. If there is a natural disaster, earthquake, flood, whatever, and you lose your house, what do you do? Where, where do you find a place where to stay? Do you become homeless? Can you still afford the renting a house? I don't know. And where there are conflicts, that is man-made disasters. So now I'm, I'm moving from natural disasters to man-made disasters. Wars, conflicts, bombs. What happens? Do you become homeless? And migration. You migrate from one country to the other or within your same country. What happens? So these are some of the questions. But besides having here experts who will touch some of these different topics, we also have an excellent example from Finland Finland was able, hello. <laughs> um, Finland was able to find an amazing way of tackling homelessness. And we are so proud to have a representative of Finland here. Now, all of this because we would like to feed the outcomes of today's meeting and event into a major one that will take place in February, early February, from the 9th to the 10th to 19th of February. It is called, okay, it is one of these UN mechanisms where countries meet and they discuss and then they decide about um, what is needed to be done. Then they bring this knowledge to the General Assembly in September and their countries will negotiate all together what some of our suggestions and recommendations are, and if they, and once they find an agreement on a common denominator, it can be a minimum common denominator, still there is a common denominator, then we have a resolution, we have a mandate, we can start taking action. This is the first time the UN is, is discussing this topic. Please, let's make sure that the outcome of this event and the others that are going to follow throughout the day will feed and, and, and make sure that we are really going to make a difference. Let's keep in mind we have a 2030 agenda with 17 goals. It's an agenda that countries decided together 
with 17 goals to be reached by the year 2030. That's why it's called 2030. And this agenda talks about sustainability as well. So it's not just a matter of finding a, you know, an ad interim solution here. It has to be sustainable. So how can we make sure that what we're going to be discussing today, we look at it from the social development perspective, but I would like to touch also the other two, the economic and the environmental one. How do we make sure that the social dimension of this issue is sustainable? I love this topic. So um, I would like uh, um, to, to, to give now the floor for welcoming remarks to, um, to uh, colleagues, if I may say, because we work for the good of people, um, from the uh, mayor's office of New York City. We have been, uh, this is the third edition of uh, United, uh, Inclusive United Cities for All and inclusive because we want to include all the social groups I mentioned. Um, and this is the third edition that actually with Victor we share. So thank you very much. And uh, we are very happy also to have um, a second commissioner from the city of New York with us. So, so both of them will give um, remarks, welcoming remarks. I would like to start with uh, Victor Calize, who is the commissioner of the mayor's office of New York for people with uh, disabilities. Just a couple of words about Victor. Um, I, um, I think that you all have the concept note, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in any case, Victor is a Kalize. Kalize, come on. You have your grandparents were Italian. Yes, so Kalize here, but Kalize as an Italian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he is a, a tireless advocate for the disability community in all city decision makings. And, um, and Commissioner Calize, Calizi chairs also the Accessibility Committee of the City Building Code and leads efforts to integrate people with disabilities into the workforce through, the New, through New York City. And he has launched the At Work Employment Initiative, among many other things. So Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Daniela. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today um, and talk about inclusive cities for all. When we're thinking about New York City, we have about uh, close to 1 million people with disabilities that are living here and uh, about 9 million people with disabilities that come visit the city every year. Mm -hmm. So we, our goal is to make New York City the most accessible city in the world. And if you look on our streets lately, you'll see lots of different things that we do for accessibility, like improving our curb cuts, to adding more uh, accessible taxis, uh, to adding affordable housing. And we have a large percentage of uh, people that are homeless on our streets, and a lot of those people that are homeless are people with disabilities. And there's a lot of reasons why those people become homeless. But our goal is to make sure that uh, we care for those people, and we have to ensure that the shelters that are around our city are accessible for people with disabilities. We have a big effort to go through each facility and ensure that accessibility is being met, not only the physical aspect of it, but also the training and the understanding of how to deal with certain types of disabilities that are in those facilities. Um, it's a daunting task, but we're committed to doing that. We, the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, have teamed up with um, social services to ensure that this is happening. We have architects on the ground uh, checking out the facilities, and we're excited uh, that we can be able to do this work to pre provide people temporary homes. The reality is that 79% uh, of people with disabilities from the working age of 18 to 64 in New York City, that's right, 79% are jobless. And we have to really change that. And that leads to homelessness in lots of different ways. So we have an um, initiative called NYC at Work. It's a public-private partnership to employ people with disabilities throughout New York City. We work with companies uh, from big to small and small businesses, big businesses, to ensure that they understand what it's like to hire a person with dis disability and how it's not just about hiring them because they have a disability, but hiring them because they have the talent. So we prepare people with disabilities for the jobs. We make sure that they are uh, ready to work. We ensure that they are qualified. And in the end, our goal is to make sure that we have 
real jobs with real pay, with real benefits, so people with disabilities don't become homeless. In conjunction with that, all the new affordable housing that's being built, 7% of it is set aside for people with, mobil uh, with disabilities. 5% for mobility and 2% for vision and hearing. Now, affordable housing, the reality of it is that you have to make $24,000 or more in, the, in, in New York to be able to get that. People with disabilities don't make that much because they're jobless. Again, you could see how the importance of work and our initiative, NYC at Work, really ties in to our affordableness. And we, we, can, we have to do this on lots of different levels to ensure that people with disabilities are integrated into society. Now, one of the big initiatives that we have, uh, along with, uh, with our NYC at Work and our affordable housing, is to understand what's happening around the country. And um, city, city with an I, city, uh, city banks, some of you may know, their community development has funded a program in New York City and, and throughout the nation to, to work with five cities, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, and Chicago, and to find out what they're doing, number one, on work, number two, on financial empowerment, and number three, on housing. So we are convening, um, New York City is convening this group and in of trying to find out what is happening in each of those cities. And once we, um, we're going to do a deep dive into each of those uh, initiatives and come up with best practices that we could share across the country that will allow us to provide all the necessary tools for people with disabilities to live a full and functional life in society. Those are the important things that we're doing. Um, in the city to ensure that people with disabilities are not homeless and that uh, we have access to jobs and make New York City the most accessible city in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like now, Miss um, Penny, uh, I'm so bad with family it's okay. names. It's, um, it's Abby Wardina, but the male Ed likes to give it like an Italian flair. Oh, really? So we could do so what Abby Wardina. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> <He actually does. laughs> okay. Um, she is uh, uh, the uh, New York City's Commissioner for International Affairs. She leads uh, the city's global platform for promoting its goals for a more just society, showcasing the diversity of New Yorkers and sharing policies and best practices with the world, and many, many other things. Uh, that you can find in the uh, in the bio. I would like Penny you to, to I would like you to share um, what you are doing with your office and other activities you are dealing with. And then, if you don't mind, I will change slightly the agenda, giving a couple of minutes to the floor um, uh, to 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 ask questions to both of you. I'm saying this because Victor, unfortunately, I think you have to leave at 11:30, or um, you can stay I, a little I, bit I longer. Got a little, I got a, uh, about 10 to. Okay, so let's make it. <laughs> so, Penny, please, thank you. Excellent, well, excellencies and distinguished guests, good morning. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with you today, in particular with one of my favorite commissioners. Um, Daniela, thank you so much for the opportunity. On behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio, thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning, but really, um, happy World Cities Day. What a great opportunity for us to highlight what is both working um, and what is not to share best practices. So I'm going to some of I'm going to overlap just a little bit with um, with Victor, but this really is about the reality that what Victor and his agency and his team do, they're implementing policies um, here in New York City, but are the purpose of my office is really to take what they're doing and bring it into the global conversation, um, amplify what's working, but also um, figure out best opportunities to exchange best practices. So as many of you know, New York City is home uh, to more than 8 million residents. And um, the de Blasio administration has spent the last five years taking on some of the systemic challenges to urbanization. Um, and I hope that what we talk about, and I look forward to the Q&A, leave you all inspired um, 
to keep doing the work that you're doing. Now, as the population of cities around the world continue to grow, ensuring adequate housing has become more crucial than ever to, sec to secure a sustainable future for all. Um, and the global goals, the sustainable development goals, particularly SDG 11, speak to the direct, uh, the direct truth of this. Um, simply put, housing is a basic human right. Um, and for New Yorkers, housing is the number one expense. And Mayor de Blasio, even in his campaign in 2013, um, recognized the urgency of that. So when um, he came um, into his, uh, his tenureship in 2014, he acknowledged the urgency of this issue and released an ambitious housing plan to create enough affordable housing for half a million New Yorkers by 2025. Now, to achieve this, New York City has accelerated the construction and preservation of affordable housing to levels not seen in 30 years here in New York City. In fact, the city has secured more affordable housing in the first four years of the de Blasio administration than any comparable period since 1978. And I'm proud to say that our initial efforts proved so successful that we have increased our target, and now our city is committing to creating and preserving 300,000 affordable apartments by 2026, enough housing for 750,000 New Yorkers. And what we're doing is we're sharing our experience, but also learning from cities and states in order to accelerate the impact in our communities. Um, and one of the ways that we have done that through the Mayor's Office for International Affairs is really map our development agenda, which includes affordable housing, which is called 1NYC, to the sustainable development goals. Um, we have been working within this context of what we call Global Vision Urban Action for the last four years. And um, last year, in 2018, we created the concept of a voluntary local review. Um, in 2018, during the high-level political forum, New York City became the first city in the world to essentially showcase to the UN, to member states, to other local and regional governments, what we are doing in terms of achieving the sustainable development goals, including affordable housing. Um, this year, um, during the UN General Assembly a couple of weeks ago, um, we have essentially launched a movement. We have about 25 cities, both domestically and internationally, who have committed to doing a voluntary local review, and that number is growing. Um, we are excited to um, know that we have everybody from the World Economic Forum to UN Habitat who have come on as partners to ensure that as cities are thinking about the work that they are doing on issues like inclusivity and affordable housing, they also recognize this opportunity through DESA to uh, participate in the voluntary local review. And the reason we have done that is that we know that there is not one fix to any challenge in this era, right? So as we continue to combat the affordability crisis, we have been very intentional about tackle, tackling it on different fronts as well as learning um, constantly from our, all, from our colleagues beyond borders. Um, one of the priorities that we have had is we've made re uh, reforms to zoning and tax programs that not only incentivize new development, but mandate the inclusion of affordable apartments paid for by the private sector. We have tripled the number of afford affordable housing set aside for households earning below the poverty line in New York City, which is $25,000. And to lower the risk of eviction, we have strengthened tenant protections and provided free lawyers to low-income New Yorkers being harassed by landlords. So we've really bolstered our rent freeze programs for seniors, people with disabilities, so that our fellow New Yorkers can stay in the neighborhoods they love. When it comes to providing access to housing, it makes sense to take a holistic approach. After all, the number one way to prevent homelessness is to keep people in their homes. So if we all want to live up to the ideals of the Sustainable Development Goals, we hope that you will use tools like the Voluntary Local Review to share best practices. Um, it is very important that we as cities flex our collective power um, to ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you again for having me today. Thank you. And um, I, I really thank both of you. Uh, you see how wonderful it is, international and domestic working together. That's exactly what we want to do here at the United Nations when we give this, this space to have this kind of dialogues and conversations. Uh, hopefully, next year uh, we will be better off in terms of um, financial constraints. So we are going through a moment of austerity here in the United Nations. I'm saying this because next year to be really inclusive, I hope we will have the financial means or maybe we will have some donors who will provide uh, the financial means to um, have this event 
with the sign language and also uh, with the, whatever it is required for visually impaired people in case we show images or movies for them to appreciate what we are doing and saying. So we are getting there. Uh, we are aware of that, we are getting there. So apologies for those who cannot benefit of this conversation today. Um, two urgent questions, if any. None. So, we, yes, please, ma'am. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Benedina Uzo. I'm a Nigerian. I represent Asabeshe Uyaradwa Foundation. I'm homeless, and I'm proud to be homeless because I became homeless to help the homeless of this country. When I heard what is going on in the shelters, how they're abusing the people, taking their money, raping them, all sorts of things. Even if they are dead, they're burying them without name tag. I started from Florida, now I'm back in New York. I want to know what you can do because it is not fair. We are 20 or 12 in one room and disabled being abused. And we heard that all the shelters are mentally disturbed institutions. We are not mentally disturbed. Why should I be among the mentally disturbed people? And why should we suffer what somebody else, you know, is suffering out there? We need just a room to call our own place and continue our life. But they say, no, three months is the law for any homeless to stay in the system and get a, a room, permanent room. But no, because the money you are paying is so beautiful. 4,000 a day per head in a lousy little small bed and 20 in a room. They won't let nobody go, okay? So I really appreciate me being here today and I will appreciate it if you all can help me solve this problem so I can stop being homeless because I'm tired already. <laughs> but I enjoyed it. And God bless you all that are contributing and doing the best to make sure that things are in order in America and outside the world. I'm not talking about here alone, home and abroad. Thank you all. Stay blessed. Thank you. This is exactly what we need uh, to, 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 to understand. We're not talking here uh, theory. We're talking about real life. So thank you for bringing this to our attention once more. Thank you. Um, so we might proceed then with the second part of this um, um, event, and uh, we are moving to the the panel and the panelists. Uh, in order, we might start maybe with um, Leila Farha. Hello, Leila. And uh, we want to greet her for her wonderful message that she has uh, recorded uh, for us. Um, Leilani Farha, she is the UN Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing. And um, let's see what, in her role as a Special Rapporteur, she can share with us. Uh, see, um, Leilani um, is the world's top watchdog on housing. And she set out uh, to uh, read you know, give more strength to the idea that housing is a social good and not an asset or a commodity. And in, uh, in the role as UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Adequate Housing since 2014, Farha has uh, presented reports to the United Nations on homelessness, the connection between housing and life itself, and the treatment of housing as a commodity and its consequences for people who are poor as well as in the middle class. Thank you. I'm Leilani Farha, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing. I'm sorry I'm not able to be with you um, at this event for World Cities Day and this um, session on inclusive cities for all, affordable housing and homelessness. Those of you who know my work, you'll know that the issue of inclusive cities is one that's been um, at the forefront of my mandate. 
Um, I am obviously particularly concerned about the relationship between the lack of affordable housing in most cities around the world and our ability to ensure that cities remain diverse and inclusive. Um, obviously, um, cities where housing is completely unaffordable, it's driving low income and poor people out um, and thus making those cities um, um, less diverse and less inclusive. I was asked to comment on three or four questions and I'll try to do so. I only have, you know, it's a three minute video, so I'll do my best. Uh, I was asked in particular about solutions to homelessness. And I will say this, um, I don't think there will be any elimination of homelessness or solving of homelessness until and unless governments recognize people living in homelessness are rights holders. People living in homelessness um, are not um, in, in those circumstances as a result of personal or moral failure. They're there because governments have failed to effectively implement the right to housing. Uh, and as rights holders, um, they have a reasonable expectation that their governments will implement uh, their human rights um, and not deny them their human rights. And so governments have accountability under international human rights law to ensure everyone has access to adequate and affordable um, and secure housing. And governments have to figure out how they're going to do that and ensure that populations do not fall into homelessness, that no populations fall into homelessness. Um, and the second thing I'd say about eliminating homelessness is it's absolutely essential that governments recognize that the financialization of housing, that is the over commodification of housing that's happening in cities around the world, is a real driver of inequality in cities. It's a driver of housing inequality. Um, and it's really making cities unlivable for, um, you know, a huge portion of, of populations, anyone living in low income um, or in poverty. And until that's addressed, um, you know, and, and regulated as a human rights issue, I don't, I don't see um, cities becoming more inclusive. Um, I was also asked about the role of um, cities in addressing homelessness and, and affordable housing. And obviously cities have a, a very important role to play. Cities like national level governments have international human rights obligations. And so they are accountable to their people. And even where cities lack resources and capacity, I think there's a lot of things cities can be doing. Um, I think that they could be passing inclusionary zoning um, laws, which mandate that, a, that any new buildings must include social housing as well as um, housing for families, as well as affordable housing for those um, who are uh, low income and working. Um, I think, you know, cities could um, harness their land resources and be very selective about when they um, sell off land, who they're selling it off to, are they ensuring that housing is being treated as a social good uh, when they sell their lands, uh, or better, better yet, don't sell lands and and really um, you know build uh, housing, uh, residential housing, um, and treat it as a social good. Um, there's many other things, and and cities really are starting to lead the way in this regard. There's many cities around the world doing very interesting things. So I'm putting a lot of stock in cities, but of course, there has to this has to be coordinated with national level government. We're not going to get anywhere if there isn't good coordination between different levels of government. Um, and the last question I was asked about, was about the various actors who um, are you know should be involved in preventing homelessness. Well, I think obviously I've said that governments have international human rights obligations, so you know, the primary responsibility is on them. I do think that private actors have uh, human rights responsibilities as well and need to be really ensuring that none of their practices are contributing to homelessness and unaffordable housing. In fact, the opposite. Business enterprises should be really working to ensure that everything they do contributes to the enjoyment of human rights in cities. So I'm going to leave it there. That's a bit of a challenge to the private sector, the real estate sector and developers and investors. Um, and I wish you all the luck uh, in your deliberations and I look forward to hearing about them. Thanks so much. Well, <clears throat> thank you to you. And uh, 
it's important because um, the, the UN Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing brought here the human rights perspective. As you know, the UN has a three pillars, peace and security, human rights and development. So we spoke about the development pillar earlier on, about the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals, goal 11, for instance. So it was good also to have now the human rights perspective. Um, I would like now to move to Ms. Lydia Stetson or? Stazen. Stazen. Um, who is the director of the Institute of Global Homelessness and uh, she has dedicated uh, her career to, build, uh, to building a world where all people have a place to call home and the strong foundation upon which they can build their lives that they envision for themselves. Thank you very much. Please, uh, uh, Lydia. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Great to be in one of the world's greatest cities on World Cities Day. Particularly happy to leave my city of Chicago, Illinois, where it is in fact snowing today. <laughs> um, so, um, as Daniela said, I'm here representing the Institute of Global Homelessness. I have six to seven minutes to talk about global homelessness, and so this is going to be a very high-level um, overview of what um, I, in my role, see around the world, common themes um, that we see in homelessness, as well as both global and local strategies to address it. Let's see if I can get this to work. So just really quickly about IGH. So our, our mission is to see global homelessness reduced around the world. Um, and we have a primary focus on raising the urgency of serving people who are literally living on the street. Um, we have a couple of primary strategies that we're working on in order to, to see that vision come to fruition. So the first thing that we do is we build sector leadership, knowledge, and connections through a variety of tactics. Um, but really making sure that, that knowledge, best practices, um, effective practices aren't having to be recreated in every single community around the world, um, but that we're able to kind of uh, scale and see those best practices at a faster level to catalyze progress. Um, our, our second strategy is around bridging research to practice. We know the very busy schedules of people who are serving those who are experiencing homelessness. They don't necessarily have the time in their day to read 120 pages of research and understand the, the minute field level changes that they need to make in order to achieve those greater outcomes. And so we try to translate that for them and come up with very easy to implement solutions. Um, and so we're doing that through our A Place to Call Home initiative, where we have had 13 cities sign on to work with us. Um, and we have facilitated goal setting, strategic planning, and are providing sort of regular implementation support to help those cities see progress on the goals <laughs> that they set. Um, our cohort runs through the end of 2020, and we are already learning learning some, some really interesting things um, about global homelessness and what it will take to, to see reductions. Um, so we were founded in 2015, so we're only five years old. Um, we're a joint initiative of DePaul University, um, a major academic center in Chicago, Illinois, and DePaul International, which is a direct service organization serving people who are homeless in, um, I think, eight different countries. And so again, you see that IGH's role is really to connect the academic learning with the, with the on-the-street mm -hmm. services to people who are experiencing homelessness. So just a quick map of the 13 cities that we're working with. We really selected a diverse cohort that represents um, you know, most of the, the continents, except for Antarctica, where there's not a high prevalence of homelessness. Um, we're a little bit heavy, we understand, on sort of the global north. Um, but again, that's, um, a, we have a representative sample of, of many, different, many different cities around the world. So just a quick overview, we know that homelessness occurs in all communities in all countries. Um, the best estimate is that 100 million people around the world are experiencing homelessness. And I asterisk that um, because these counts all use various definitions and various methodologies, so we are not comparing apples to apples. What we do see, regardless of, of what city is reporting, um, we see that it is disproportionately affecting people who are living at intersections of various social issues. So poverty, race or minority status. Um, so 
for example, in Australia, um, people who are Aboriginal experience homelessness at higher rates. So it doesn't matter, you know, what your country's um, sort of marginalized peoples are, they're overly represented in homelessness. Gender, orienta gender and sexual orientation, disabilities, physical health concerns, mental health concerns, past trauma, veteran status. Again, these are the themes we see around the world. So what are some global strategies that this body can think about um, in terms of effectively addressing homelessness? So one is there is a lot of academic debate around definitions of homelessness. People say all the time, we can't define it, it looks different in every country. That is true, but that academic debate keeps us from feeling the urgency of addressing it. And so I believe that if we can incorporate some common language into United Nations resolutions, documents, we will be able to point to that as, as a globally accepted, inclusive definition of homelessness. Along with that is aligning measurement and clear methodologies of how we are counting people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and I deliberately didn't use bullets, I deliberately used the, the numbers one, two, and three because they have to go in that order. So first we need to agree on this inclusive framework. Uh, out of that we need to be Count, regularly counting people who fall into those categories of homelessness. And then once we have a handle on the scope of homelessness, we can start to set some specific measurable goals to prevent and reduce the occurrence of homelessness. So moving from the globe, oh, actually I popped up um, a, a framework that IGH has worked on a couple of years ago. This draws on several different typologies of homelessness, but again, um, we have worked on this framework to be as inclusive as possible, to represent as many different manifestations of homelessness around the world, and we've piloted this in, in our cities around the world to, so that when we go into a city, they can point to on this framework and tell us this is what homelessness means here. Then we have a common understanding and we can begin to put strategies together with them. Um, so, so moving from the global to the local, um, homelessness truly is a loss of community. And so what we coach our cities through is that the solution has to then come from the community. We have to restore community back to the people who have lost it. Um, and so what that takes is the entire community rising up and saying this is not acceptable. Um, no matter what our sector is, if we are business, if we are healthcare, we feel a responsibility and a duty to be ending this issue in our community. And so it takes a shift from a charity mindset to a justice and to a complex problem-solving mindset. It has to be more than handing out the soup. That's a very important part of it, but that is not going to end homelessness. Um, so we have a couple of pillars that we see, again, from our work around the world um, that are that are some, some pillars that each, each community needs to figure out how to address. So first of all, um, it needs to be person-centered. We need to feel a sense of urgency on this issue, um, and we need to be thinking about the people who are experiencing homelessness. So one example um, kind of on this pillar is um, a survey was done um, of homeless shelters in the United States and some shelters have as many as 80 different rules that people need to follow in order to maintain their bed. Things like um, you cannot wear a hat inside the shelter. Um, very well intentioned rule at some point I'm sure, but how are we creating extra levels of bureaucracy that force people who are experiencing a trauma to continue to self-advocate. We're making it harder for people. Um, so, so having a person-centered approach to this is the, is the number one most important pillar. Secondly, you have to have a broad stakeholder group um, that is setting clear goals and has ownership for making progress on those goals. There has to be diverse funding streams, there has to be continued data analysis so that you can know what's working and what isn't working. There have to be comprehensive services that run the full gamut from prevention to permanent and affordable housing. Um, and then you have to have a really flexible housing system that, that runs everywhere from shelters to housing first programs to vouchers, other types of public and social housing, um, fair market rent. Um, and the system needs to be flexible so that it can expand and contract to serve the needs that your data is, is watching you overcome. A PowerPoint slide makes it look really easy. <laughs> it's very complex work, um, but again, from, from our seat working in many different countries, those are some of the themes um, that we are actively coaching our cities to work through. Well, thank you. I think we are all going to benefit of your studies. <laughs> 
Um, so I hope you took notes. I also took a few for questions that will follow later on. Um, and then, oh, another complicated name, but I'll do my best. Mr. Yuha Kakinen. Thank I'm you. sorry, there's no Italian version of my name. <laughs> no, there is. There is a Kakinen. Is a, sounds very Italian to me now. Um, <laughs> Um, he is the chief executive of the Y Foundation, an experienced and passionate developer of innovative housing solutions to homeless people and the social housing. Uh, Yuha has worked in uh, public administration of, in, the, in the city of Helsinki, and uh, he worked as a consultant, as a researcher, and also as a consultant and CEO of Social Development LTD. Um, I would also like to say that now being uh, the chief of uh, the executive chief executive of uh, uh, Y Foundation, uh, I would like to say that this is the biggest Finnish NGO providing housing for homeless people and uh, social housing. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to take part in the discussion and describe the, the Finnish system. Uh, I work in a Y Foundation, which is a non-profit social housing provider. Actually, we are now the fourth biggest landlord in Finland also. And it was established in 85 to solve the issue of single homelessness in Finland, to end the homelessness of single persons. And the name of the foundation comes from a Finnish word, yksinäinen, which means a single or a lonely person, just to explain the, the name. Uh, so we have at the moment around 17,000 flats around in 55 municipalities in, in Finland. And we work in a very wide partnership between several organizations. We have partners, or over 100 partners in the, in the country. Uh, this is the grim reality at the moment in, in, in Europe. And as you can see, there are two countries where homelessness has been decreasing. And Norway is the other one, but from the EU countries, Finland has been the, the only country where homelessness has decreased. And this is how homelessness in Finland at the moment seems to be. We have around 5,500 homeless persons. Most of them are single homeless persons. And over 70% are living temporarily with friends and relatives. So it's about sofa surfing and a form of hidden homelessness. There's no street homelessness anymore in, in Helsinki. You can't see people sleeping, sleeping on, the, on the streets. Uh, the actual number of rough sleeping is, is, is extremely low at the moment. And in recent years, we have made progress, especially with long-term homeless people, people with uh, serious social and health issues, substance abuse, drug abuse, etc. So this is, the, this is the thing we have been concentrating since 2008, when we started a national program to reduce long-term homelessness. I worked five years as a program leader in, in this program, and there were two main things that we wanted to do. We wanted to change completely the existing staircase model and to concentrate on, on housing first, as we understood it. And actually, I have to explain that uh, this is not the US model of housing first, because we were totally unconscious about the existing of housing first in USA when we started the program. We, we labeled it housing first because it de described so well what we were aiming to do. And then we went to Google and realized that housing first actually existed. But a lot of things are similar with, with the US model, of course. But the Finnish way is to, to, to work in very clear targets. So we had a quantitative target to have 2,500 new apartments, places to live for, for long-term homeless people, and to move away from temporary accommodation in shelters and, and dormitory type hostels into supported housing units and independent flats. And maybe this table describes more dramatically what has changed. In 85, we had still over 2,000 bed places in hostels and shelters in Helsinki. And now there's one service center for emergency accommodation with, with 52 bed places. And they have been replaced by supported housing units or independent rental flats during these years. And as you can see, also the social housing stock is, is quite extensive in, in, in Helsinki. For us, housing first means that it's a basic human social right. 
its housing in normal surroundings and its permanent homes, its independent rental flat, you have your own rental contract, normally it's, it's a permanent rental contract, and adequate support if you need it. But it's extremely important for us, the principle of normality, which means that when you have a rental contract, you have the same rights and obligations as everybody else in the same situation. So you are, for example, supposed to pay the rent, and unless you, can't, you don't have the, the money to pay it, you can get the general housing benefit as everybody else in the same situation. So this is the principle of normality as we understand it. But uh, you can think about that in many European countries you have housing first experiments at the moment. But it seems that there's a lack of something. And, and actually, I think that the main thing is that you can't have housing first without having housing first. So it's a question about having this housing available. And my colleagues in many countries say that, of course, we would upscale housing first, but we don't have the housing. So this is the issue to be solved. And there are different ways. This is an example how we solve the issue of temporary accommodation by providing instead supported housing in, in normal, normal rental, rental apartment buildings. Vinyl supported housing unit with 33 apartments. It was built by Wow Foundation. It's, it's leased to the city of Espoo and they make the rental contracts with the tenants. And the support is provided by Salvation Army, which is, by the way, at the moment, one of the most progressive organizations in Finland working with homeless people, providing work rehabilitation, for example. And, and, and the change, how they have, how they have changed the, their way to work is an, a good example that it's, it's possible to change the way how you work with homeless people. The role of affordable social housing, you can get evidence from other countries also. This is from an Australian study with a very wide empirical data which, which proves that it's a very strong protective factor reducing the risk of homelessness to have affordable social housing available. And in Finland it means that in each new housing area there are, there are at least 25% affordable social housing Housing which the quality is ex exactly the same as in the, in the private market, but the rent level is, uh, yes. An example of what it can be, this is social housing building, where we have part of it is reserved for low-income musicians in Finland, and I can assure you that there are hundreds of those. The recipe, how to end homelessness, I think that it's housing first, and it's to move away from temporary to accommodation to permanent housing solution. And it means that this is the common minimum common denominator if you want to end homelessness, to have a home instead of shelter. And I would say that the idea is to end homelessness. This is the only, only goal that you can have. You have to work to end homelessness. And our present government has decided that within the next eight years, homelessness in Finland will be completely eradicated. Wow. And I think that this may sound simple and clear because it is. It's a question about human value, human rights and political will and doing things instead of talking about doing things. And most of all, it's a question about human dignity, I think. As George Orwell already said, that either we all live in a decent world or nobody does. Thank you. I had no doubts that your presentation was going to be explosive. So, in a, in a constructive way. So, thank you very much. Um, now, um, let's move to Ms. Gianna Zamaro. This I know how to pronounce beautifully, also because be besides being Italian, like me, um, we come from the same region. Isn't that lovely? So um, Gianna Zamaro, uh, she uh, obtained a postgraduate uh, speciality in intensive care and anesthesia from the University of Trieste, where I studied as well. And uh, she also has a post degree speciality in medical statistics. That's interesting. And health planning. 
since 1998, oh, that's Trieste, hi. And uh, <laughs> so uh, Gianna Zamaro has been member of the advisory committee within uh, the WHO Health Cities Project from 2004 and 2007. She's also the health director of Friuli Venezia Giulia and many, many other things, including being member of the WHO Task Force on Evaluation for the Healthy Cities Project and Technical Focal Point for the Friuli Venezia Giulia region. So, Gianna, please share with us your knowledge. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I, this is the point of view of a region, and uh, we are, I, our region uh, in the last uh, 30 years uh, has been undertaking active policies uh, for early recognition of individuals and families at risk of poverty and planning and enacting <coughs> sorry, strategies to contrast uh, it with a multidimensional approach. So um, some data, uh, up to 45% of individuals looking for municipality social services assistance are affected by financial problems, uh, working problems, housing problem, and problems, and these people, adults, adults in most cases, uh, have been increasing the number of consequences of the last 10 years uh, global economic crisis. And uh, the um, percentage of homelessness uh, uh, in our region is 0 0.001, uh, which is a small amount, but uh, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm now talking about the prevention and after uh, uh, about the homelessness. So in order to contrast uh, um, poverty and social exclusion uh, of the families, including the single member, member ones, uh, subsidies are granted under condition of being take charge by municipal social services. Um, this is uh, the MIA, based on in an integrated assessment of both problems and needs uh, for, of each family. Uh, the social services build up a specific projects to be jointly realized with the regional offices responsible for work and training and with the NGOs, absolutely, we are, we are um, quite uh, close to the NGOs and uh, the partner of uh, our offices. So the last step uh, of the taking charge process is an inclusion agreement stating the goals um, for each family um, member uh, and the obligation uh, that they commit to uh, undertake. So we have uh, more or less 18,000 user, users a year, 93% are adults, uh, only inside adults, 7% uh, of the people. This is the situation, the systematic review and evaluation of achievements within the inclusion agreement as paramount in the taking charge projects. Um, Oh, sorry. This is the uh, the process of the MIA. So we um, at the on the left the taking charge uh, with an, an integrating approach uh, and the past education, training, job placement, social inclusion, uh, collaboration with NGOs, strong collaboration with an inclusion agreement and after the economic support measures uh, such as social uh, <coughs> card uh, reduction of uh, rental uh, fees, economic uh, contributes uh, and so on. And um, so uh, the first data on the taking charge of projects uh, uh, outcomes are available with the reference to four more or less uh, 5,000 families, uh, 71.2 Point two percent has achieved all the goals set in the inclusion agreement, which is good. 25% has achieved them partially, uh, making improvements in all areas attaining just uh, some of the targets. Uh, only 4% more or less uh, cannot achieve. Uh, the goals uh, you can see uh, achieved uh, are parental care, social relational field and personal autonomy, housing and, uh, and work. So um, we adopted the following measures against poverty, solid solidarity, regional fund, add regional funds on the social card, 
it is a national endowment, a partnership and support to the NGOs offering homelessness day and night hospitality and the promotion of the social economy through synergies between public sector, private and NGOs and the local health authorities. Uh, I forgot to, <laughs> to insert. So we, uh, we, have a, uh, we, we are developing an, an observatory on social policies. Um, because uh, uh, we need to provide analysis and perspectives on uh, distress and poverty phenomena. Uh, we, we strongly uh, trust in this. Uh, and, uh, and here, homelessness, the, um, it is, of course, the extreme condition of the severe marginality in some cases and requires a complex and multidimensional approach. Um, our strategy. Uh, I have to say that uh, in, uh, in, uh, it is uh, systematically fought in uh, every municipality of the region. Uh, the phenomenon uh, is quite uh, high in Trieste, for example, which is the, the main uh, city in the region. Less in Udine, for example, or in Pordenone. Um, but in Trieste, uh, it, it is quite uh, heavy and uh, the, the problem. And, um, okay, uh, we are uh, in place uh, the support services uh, as uh, other cities, uh, uh, day os hospitality service, daytime shelters, residential shelters, and so on. The social secretary service uh, with information and so on. The taking charge services, I would like to stress the tailor-made projects uh, because we are, uh, focalize on the centrality of the, of the person, absolutely, and uh, if it's possible, uh, um, his or her relations uh, and uh, analysis of the context, counseling and uh, psychological education support and legal support, and uh, overnight, of course, hospitality services, as in, uh, and we are including housing first. Uh, so, um, just uh, two slides and I'm finished. Uh, housing first, the state's right to a home is a fundamental human right for everyone. Uh, it's a multi-layer strategy combining housing measure with care, social inclusion and welfare action. Uh, and a long period tool to be regarded as a social investment. Here is the, the promotes the community welfare and uh, might open new perspectives uh, on innovative policies uh, for the housing market, uh, introducing specific housing solution. I'm at uh, reconciling individuals with their living spaces. Uh, and uh, so we are um, part, we, uh, we, we belong to the Housing First Italian Network and uh, we are strongly uh, working. Uh, only three key messages, that complex poverty requires complex answers, and uh, subsidies are not enough in themselves uh, as they don't remove the structural causes uh, and the individual poverty, just as <coughs> job placement or providing shelters. And true social inclusion might be only achieved through a simultaneous approach on critical areas of work, income and housing, and on the announcement of relational community and social network of individuals in a severe marginality condition. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> I was dreaming, sorry. Besides the, 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 the relevance of what you shared, the statistics, and I will ask you a couple of questions later on that triggered my curiosity. But you saw there the sea and then the Alps where we go skiing in winter time. It's a beautiful region, close parenthesis. Um, so, and now, this is going to be also a very interesting contribution to the conversation we're having today. And I would like to ask Miss Ruth Moati, how is it going to be pronounced? Thank you. Uh, she's a youth. She's a youth. <laughs> so maybe I have the wrong. Uh, oh, well, 
So I introduced you also the youth, and that later on, after you, there will be other youth, actually, who will share with us uh, some thoughts. I think that they come as delegates or representatives from uh, Qatar. So, no, 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 from the Emirates. Don't make this mistake. <laughs> it is as if somebody were saying that, you know, that I'm French instead of Italian, so apologies. With all respect for French people. Huh? Uh, so, um, uh, apologies. Uh, um, <laughs> that's it, the, far, the Valdimira Gracia, how do you pronounce? Grassano. Grassano, you see? Italiano. <laughs> <laughs> A director of the leadership school from the state of uh, Paraná government, Brazil. Um, we do have uh, quite uh, good relationships, I have to say, with Brazil and uh, with the state of, um, of um, Paraná as well. And um, I know that uh, the state of Paraná actually is building up a very strong network among municipalities and, uh, and uh, mayors. Yes. So I would like to know from you what is the experience in the Paraná government uh, on homelessness and affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for this opportunity. In fact, I'm not prepared to speak in, in English, so my friend Guilherme will do it for me, okay? We shall give to you eight minutes because of the translation. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. So, uh, good morning, and I'm really honored to speak. It's actually Miro's presentation, but I'm just going to do my <laughs> best. I mean, Miro's the director of the school leadership that actually does a great work to form leaders in Paraná across to establish. Thank you. Uh, a good a thinking in long-term thinking uh, among leadership in the state of Paraná. And so uh, this is the challenge we face in Paraná across homeless. So we have 32,000 uh, homeless people in the state of Paraná in an urban deficit of two, 273,000 uh, areas in urban areas. and. 16,000 rural areas. So urban areas account for most of the problems of housing in the city of Paraná. Uh, and 70% of people in the city of Curitiba, which is the largest city in Paraná, they actually, 70% of the homeless come from another city. So actually we, we, we're dealing in Paraná with a nationwide uh, problem of housing. And Paraná, of course, receives a lot of people from other states. So, uh, so actually, we to deal with the problem of housing, it's not just, uh, when I used to work at federal government, I was national secretary of youth, uh, I already dealt with the, these problems of housing. And actually, the variables are not just cost versus, uh, so, so actually, oh, we have uh, houses that cost less are not actually the best always. So we had a huge problem in the federal government uh, of people who left the houses built by the government because the houses were too close to each other, they had too much of a small space, and people couldn't access uh, medical facilities, education, they couldn't do that because, because of transportation, uh, access to, to those services. So for instance, the elderly, you have to actually make uh, health facilities closer because the elderly are not going to take uh, for themselves walk long distances. So if those variables are not uh, taken into account, people actually leave the houses. They don't, they don't take so we, we, expend, we end up expending more money and the results are worse. So actually better housing leads to better results. So it costs more but it leads to better results. So green areas in housing, access to education. So we're shifting the paradigm in Paraná so to take into account families and trust in community. So we're working with uh, centers of reference for homeless people, so the centers of health, so where they can have access to health care, to hygiene, to better food. Our new housing programs are taking into account green areas, uh, access to services. We're taking into account this, this, wait, yeah. We have 
uh, hosting units, so uh, units f uh, focused on the elderly. But now this experience here in the United Nations has been very good because we're understanding that intergenerational work is actually pretty good for, for us. So this is another shift in paradigm because uh, if we were used to just cheap housing uh, sponsored by the government, now we're seeing that we need to create an environment. And now we're taking into account that this environment needs to be intergenerational. It needs to take into account different generations. We also have this, uh, this, this program, which is called To Live Better Paraná, which is for the elderly. So in 14 cities, the 14 biggest cities, now most of the population in Paraná, Afu Paraná has a, a large rural population. Most of the people live in large cities, and most of the problems in housing come from large cities. So this is, it's a very urban problem. Uh, yeah, so in this year, the 14 biggest cities, 14 cities with population superior to 70,000, uh, we're going to build those houses for the elderly in those cities. So it's uh, because many of the people, many of the problems in housing come from elderly people. It's another statistic uh, we're seeing here that it's actually a problem across the world. So it's uh, Paraná is not that mm -hmm. different. So we're taking into account the, the sustainable development goals into Paraná. So we're taking into account economics because people actually need to have a job for, for the actually to improve because to give housing and not deal with entrepreneurship, with economic activity, it's not a good, good practice. And social and environmental uh, uh, part of, the, of that development. So we're taking that into account. So we want to insert Parana into those standards, those international standards. And, and also, Brazil has a huge problem with what we call sl uh, with slums, what we call favelas, those poor housing. So it, it's not just homeless, but actually you need to improve housing of people. Because people actually assemble houses with poor materials, and, and that's not good quality of living. We actually visit many of these housings, and we actually need to improve those. But to improve those, in a way that people can actually have families, be closer to their families, because two small spaces, you have to be separated from those families. And they have one, two kids, they have to leave the houses. So it's not just because, uh, it's not just a matter of replacing the favela with a small housing. It's a matter of actually creating good cities for families, for people. So this is, this is the challenge we face. The governor has put a, an ambition, uh, that in eight years, in four to eight years, we actually see no slums in the state of Paraná. Now, we have a state with uh, some of uh, the lowest, uh, lowest rate of slums in Brazil, so it's not a, the worst <laughs> case scenario, but we believe it's possible, I mean, so that's what we're working to. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so thanks a lot and... <laughs> Um, other very good examples of what can be done and some already pragmatic results that we, we can bring to the table maybe next February during the, during the Commission for Social Development to show how we all in our different roles uh, are promoting the acceleration of the sustainable development goals and in this case is SDG uh, 1 poverty eliminating poverty or reducing poverty SDG 8 employment and decent work, SDG, SDG 10, reducing inequality, economic and social inequalities, SDG 11, cities, um, SDG 16, it comes, you know, when we focus on cohesive societies, and SDG 17, collaboration, partnerships. So it's very interesting, and thank you for having brought this example that again shows it can be done. I would like now to move to a younger person and allow me to say that um, the youth of yesterday <coughs> right now has a shared uh, policies and approaches to the youth of today. And I would like to ask the youth of today to talk to the youth of tomorrow. 
Okay? So I would be very interested to hear now from uh, Ruth uh, Moati, um, who is uh, the Israeli's youth delegate to the 74th G General Assembly of the United Nations, to share your experience. You, you have um, so far done so many things, uh, from uh, serving the army to focusing on the agricultural areas and dimensions of work, um, to mm, also uh, supporting and providing legal assistance to underprivileged people. So many, many initiatives uh, for being so, so young, at least from my perspective. And, um, and I would like uh, also to un underline the fact that um, you dedicated, uh, uh, you are dedicated to strengthening Israelis' uh, youth involvement in the achievement of the 2030 Agenda and the 17 Goals, uh, um, and um, you know, to, to harnessing the Israeli spirit of innovation to impact change worldwide. So I would like to hear from you as a youth of today talking to the youth of tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ruth Moati. I'm 24 years old. I'm from Israel. And I'm very honored to be here today and give this statement in the name of all youth delegates. And uh, because this subject of affordable housing and, uh, and homelessness is very crucial and important and affecting our generation. Over the past decades, the process of urbanization has pushed billions of people to cities in search of hope of better life. My generation is faced with the consequences of this process, perhaps none greater than that of finding a home, finding a place to belong. As humans, our communities are comprised of the people who are part of our lives, whether it be in our homes, at school, at work, or through our hobbies. The harsh reality is that people who are homeless often lack many of these sources for which they can build their community. Our communities are crucial aspects of our lives. It is the people we socialize with. It is the people who we turn when we need advice or help. It is the people who might tell us about a job they think might be good for us. It is the people who will introduce us to hobbies and the people who share our interests. Being a part of society, of a community, gives one a feeling of belonging. Not having a community can lead to a sense of despair because there is no one around you to help you. Such a feeling of despair is a problem for many members of my generation who leave their communities to find work in urban areas. They come to new cities and do not know anyone. If they have a problem, they have no one to turn to. This is the result of what we call the social problems of urbanization. Whereas the number of affordable housing units the physical problem of urbanization is a problem that the public sector is better equipped to solve. My generation believes that the social problem is one that the private sector is bet better positioned to solve. We must work to build communities. The concept of shared living spaces has started to spread in Israel. In these spaces, people have the privacy of their own room, but share with others a kitchen and living areas. Co-living both offers affordable living and facilitates the creation of vibrant and supportive community. Homelessness is also not only a physical problem of not having an actual home. It is also a social problem that is being uh, separated from society. There is a huge amount of mistrust between the homeless and the rest of society. They feel many times rightfully so that society has abandoned them. It is not enough to put a roof over someone's head. We must also work to build trust and integrate them back into society by helping facilitating a sense of belonging. Home Base is an Israeli uh, soccer NGO that is comprised of teams that are made up of all members of society, no matter their background or whether they have a regular home. Their aim is to help homeless individuals to integrate back into society through football. For those who are homeless, being part of such a team allows them to socialize with others who share their interest on a level playing field, literally. On the football pitch, they are an equal member of the team. Such, such interaction creates camaraderie and builds trust. It changes how the homeless feel about the rest of society 
and just as importantly, how the rest of society feels about homeless people. New friendships are, found, are founded and new co uh, communities are built. I speak on behalf of a generation that seeks to use its innovative nature to find new ways to solve the social aspect of our urbanization. We want to work together with our governments as they work to solve the physical problem by creating communities. In our vision, these communities are accessible to and welcome of all people, no matter what they're from and where they live or if they have a disability. Urbanization is inevitable. However, its consequences are not. We hope that by working together, this international community can embrace the innovative spirit of our generation and form many new communities around the world. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm really proud uh, of what you said and what you shared with us. Um, we do, in, in the division I lead, we run the UN Youth Delegates Program. I'm really, really proud that you are part of that program and, uh, and that you will bring uh, this knowledge and this uh, awareness, raising awareness, and then pra practical solutions also to the youth of today and, as I said, to the youth of tomorrow, the children. We have to prepare them. You, it's your role. We, young uh, you, youth of yesterday, we're sharing with you what we know today. And you, as youth of today, have to share with the youth of tomorrow, children, okay? It's very important. And, and thank you for mentioning two things, um, sport. Um, I forgot to say that the division I lead uh, has also the honor for the whole UN system globally to be the focal point on sport for development and peace. So we can do a lot about that. And the sport can be an amazing tool um, to, um, to give a space for recreational activities and else to people who are homeless or not. And actually, it can help in a joyful way to get to know each other and not be scared about each other because usually fear comes from ignorance, not knowing, right? So thank you for mentioning that. And, uh, and also, you said also something that triggered my curiosity and we should focus on that. Uh, the emotional homelessness, okay? One can move to another country for working reasons, study, healthcare, whatever, have a house in the new country or in the new city or in the new place, even within the same country where one goes, but can be isolated or have no friends or no family or no uh, emotional support. So indeed, uh, the emotional homelessness, I think that is something we should focus on because uh, it might affect more and more the future generations. As we said, we are moving towards rural areas. 67, 68% of the population by the year 2050 will live in urban areas. So we have also to take care of those who, who stay in rural areas, what's happening there. And, um, and uh, we will live more and more in, in cities that might have a completely different shape and the social structure than the one we know now. So we have to make sure that we don't feel emotionally homeless because that can bring to so many different kinds of sicknesses, mental and emotional, psychological. I don't want to go any further, but my imagination is running fast right now. So we have to prevent that as well. Thank you so much. And now talking about the youth of today, talking to the youth of yesterday, because we are still here, so we can still contribute, and the youth of tomorrow. I would like to ask uh, uh, the representative of the Emirates, where I'm going to be in Dubai in, on the 13th of this month, by the way, about sports. Sorry? That's a very good time to visit. Right? UAE, yes. Yeah, the weather it, is getting perfect right now. Yes, so um, if you can introduce yourself, Thank and you. I consider you to be a discussant, uh, in this in this event and uh, and share with us um, you. your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Maryam Belhoul and I'm one of the United Arab Emirates youth delegates and I have my colleague Ahmed as well at the back of the room, the other youth delegate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we are both members of a non-profit organization called With Hope in the UAE and it aims to raise awareness on mental health. 
And as we heard from the various experts on the panel, that homelessness is indeed very closely linked with mental health and the effects it can have. So um, our input here today is to share our best practices that we bring from back home, uh, preventative measures that have been taken to tackle this challenge through different tools. So first of all, I'll be speaking about housing programs. So in the UAE, we have the Sheikh Zayed housing program and the Mohammed bin Rashid housing establishments, which are examples of our government's efforts in providing appropriate housing to the nationals in country. So what our government decided to do is to have like a national umbrella that brings together all the tools that can contribute to ensuring that every national in the country does have appropriate housing. And it provides services related to housing, such as granting residential plots, governmental houses, ready houses, maintaining and extending the current houses, and giving housing loans as per the policies and international uh, regulations. The second point that I'd like to focus on is uh, noting that victims of violence, if the country didn't take appropriate measures, can end up in the streets. So um, we have a shelter in the UAE that operates as a non-profit organization, and it deals with women and children that are victims of domestic violence, child abuse, and human trafficking. It offers victims immediate protection and support services in accordance with international human rights obligation, in addition to safe housing and rehabilitation services. So this is what we would like to bring to the table here today, and we thank you for sharing your best practices um, from around the world, and we hope to continue to learn from one another. Thank you. Thank you. Another important contribution. Um, we run a little bit late, but I think that we can have around 10 or 15 minutes at our disposal for um, <coughs> Fine, you know, besides listening very patiently, but now it's also the, ter the time for those who have spoken so far to listen uh, to you. And let's engage in a conversation here, and then once we leave the room, I do hope that we will have bilaterals, trilaterals, whatever, you know. We promote a lot of multilateralism here, more than uh, bilateralism. So, Amin is coming to me with, a, oh yes, I know, I know. I will skip lunch doesn't matter. So I prefer to be here and have a conversation. So come on, let's start the conversation here. Do, do you mind if I, if I ask a couple of questions? Right. Thanks. Burning questions. Um, yes. To Jannat uh, Zamaro. Um, you said that, you, you shared with us the, 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 this, uh, these policies against poverty that have been issued uh, in, the, in, in the region of Friuli, Venezia, Giulia. I was just curious to know when, when they were issued. And the other, the other question I wanted to, so when, when they have been adopted, since I don't remember the date. And then um, you said, you know, there is kind of a, besides the city of Trieste, but from the slides you showed, uh, there is a slight uh, percentage of homelessness, homeless people in the region. I would like to ask you why Trieste is not as well off as the other cities, if they, the mayors or the rules in that city are different than the other cities in the region. And, uh, and who are the homeless people? Older people, migrants, who are they? So, uh, I, I begin uh, with the last one. Why Trieste uh, more than the other cities in the region? Uh, because Trieste uh, is quite bigger than the others, and uh, the family network uh, and uh, is uh, is um, is uh, less uh, uh, representative than in the other places. You know that our region uh, um, is a, a small region, um, and uh, the the the, ne the family network is quite strong. Uh, and even in the in the cities uh, um, like Udine or Pordenone, um, in Trieste is another. Uh, is, is, is in some way I can uh, consider an enclave in some in some way, uh, where people uh, 
uh, can stay as a high quality of life. Sometimes uh, uh, people coming from uh, the east part of Europe uh, or north uh, and so on, and they stay there. And uh, um, we don't know uh, uh, why, uh, but the, the reasons are uh, because of the... the, the the city is bigger because of lack of in uh, network, family network, and, and so on. Um, And the laws and the policies that we adopted, the ASI, one law uh, was adopted uh, um, uh, more, more or less uh, uh, eight years ago. And uh, the um, uh, this uh, we the, the MIA the misura support uh, the misura de support al reddito uh, we introduced um, it uh, five years three years ago sorry three years ago um, we put uh, uh, a lot of uh, millions of, of euros uh, just to uh, help families uh, and uh, people living alone to. Uh, to avoid uh, uh, and to fight uh, uh, poverty, because we strongly believe uh, in prevention. Thank you. Um, and then the, la the other question, and then I, I really uh, wait for others to ask questions. Um, it was, I think Ruth mentioned uh, um, sport, yes. Um, and and um, I was wondering here, no, yes, sport. But then also, also our colleagues from Paraná actually spoke about homelessness, affordable housing, and entrepreneurship. You, you used the entrepreneurship. So I would be interested in knowing what could be the role of youth entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in, in uh, providing solutions um, or, or else to find ways to overcome homelessness or affordable housing. Uh, for instance, in Paraná, we have a NGOs. Usually, young people are behind those NGOs to reform Islam houses. So this is a big part. And many people are, in the, uh, young people especially, they are investing in... Because usually, when we think of housing in Brazil, we have these huge companies of housing, these huge construction companies. But actually, today... Uh, this is small NGOs, uh, people, they are reforming houses. And also we are, we, well, I used to be uh, the coordinator of entrepreneurship in the, in the state. And we had a program to, um, to incentivize uh, entrepreneurship among poor populations. So it's, it's a two, two way, uh, two way, I guess. One way is to, to strengthen uh, entrepreneurs in the housing area we, uh, that work with housing area and so forth. And the other way is to, form, uh, to uh, sponsor entrepreneurship among populations that live in bad housing or uh, they can start their own business because uh, we'd like that every single state-sponsored uh, housing initiative had economic activity. So because it would improve a lot more. So green areas and economic activity in every single uh, state-sponsored housing. So, so this is the idea. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's all organization called World Roma Federation. Thank you. So my name is Janos Stoika. I'm calling about World Roma Federation. We are an ECOSOC non-for-profit organization. Uh, actually, we represent for Roma people around the world. Like uh, our peoples is uh, usually for social, is very really behind to the life, actually, for the economic system all over. And usually, we're also looking for a solution for our people because uh, the homeless things 
for our people is, is extremely terrible. People living in the street, people living for a, a breach. So usually we have a lot of problem in all overs. So we're also looking for a solution for our people uh, because today is a great honor in here, first of all. The paneling is really, really interesting for our people because we're also looking for a solution for the people, how we're gonna be able to get affordable home for our peoples too. We have a couple ideas. We also do a lot of research, actually. Which one is the better way to gonna be integrate for our peoples? Because most of them are people, for the Roma people, the number one problem is for the, as the rural area. So usually, the space, the living condition, the housing and developing. So usually, we also looking for a solution. I hear a lot of good uh, ideas in here, which one is really, really value for us. And uh, thank you for here. Well, thank you. Um, back in Italy, when I was working for the Minister of Foreign, uh, of, uh, the Council of the, the presidency, presidency of the Council of Ministers in Italy, I was also working in areas related to social affairs, etc. And we were also focusing on Roma, which is um, um, an issue that we are also facing in Italy and in Europe. And I recall um, another time when I went to. Africa, North Africa, I spoke to some nomads. I mean, those, also, those are also groups that migrate. And I remember in the Sahara Desert. And I remember they brought that to my attention and they said, we migrate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's who we are. But nowadays, there are borders everywhere. We don't have a passport. So if we want our children to attend school, so, you know, while we migrate, our children are not allowed to. We, we don't know what to do. If we need uh, health care, we don't know what to do because we have no passport. This is our, you know, we, we are nomads. Uh, so even though they migrate and move in the Sahara Desert, uh, other Roma, if I think of Europe, they move not in the Sahara Desert, they move among countries and regions, but definitely, um, since we are talking about rural uh, urban uh, um, planning and uh, uh, urban planning, I think that you brought up a very interesting uh, topic here to make sure that also Roma people or nomads or wherever, um, there is a space that they consider <laughs> home for the time that they are going to be in that area of the world. Thank you. Please. It's uh, like almost a year ago we was visiting in Italy, in Scampia. And how's the living condition for the people, how is going to be living for the Roma people is there, is outside to the city. And I like to be meet uh, for, uh, let me see, for Miss Gianna there. Yeah, Mrs. Gianna Zamaro. I like to be talk to you about for this, for the condition is there, because it's really, really important. People, how he's going to be living is unbelievable for many, many years. He's in hoping to somebody help them to going to be make change for the lifestyle and the situation. Uh, people, he, a lot of, lot of newborn kids is going to be uh, burning is there for the lot of effect and a lot of stuff. So usually this is the reason. So it's a great panel. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, you brought up uh, now another issue, children. Children who are born in uh, homeless families, often they're not registered. So you don't know that they exist. And, but also children who live on the street. Um, it's not being completely homeless, but it might lead uh, later on to become homeless. So thank you for bringing that to our attention as well. Waiting for, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Philippe de Corto of UN Habitat, and of course, housing is at the core of our mandate and our work. Uh, and we have a housing at the, of, at the center approach, which is very closely linked to housing first, of course, as uh, uh, introduced by some of the speakers. But I had a question because when we s there is always a social stigma with homelessness. And even if we create housing solutions for them, where do we integrate them? Where do we create that housing? So if the, if the, the speaker of Finland could kind of expand on uh, the choices they made of, of to localize these kind of housing solutions uh, in terms of making sure they're integrated into the neighborhoods and we have truly inclusive cities. Um, I want to thank you very much. With UN Habitat, we have an amazing relationship. Uh, last year, uh, no, this year, 
Uh, we organized, uh, thanks to UN Habitat, a very important expert group meeting in preparation for, in preparation for the Commission on, on Social Development next year on homelessness and affordable housing. And this is actually uh, the United Nations Cities Day, right? That is um, uh, a mandate of UN Habitat. Uh, it, since three years, we have uh, this uh, inclusive United Cities for All. Uh, and this year, definitely, we want to contribute to, to what UN Habitat has been organizing throughout the day. Thank you so much. Please. Uh, in Finland, we have a common policy that in each new housing area, there is always at least 25% social housing. So the issue is to provide normal, normal housing in normal surroundings. There are no special areas for homeless people. Homeless people are living among other people. And for example, Y Foundation, we have around 6,000 flats that we have bought from the private market, individual flats, and homeless people are living in these flats, among other people. I think this is extremely important to have this social housing as a, as a ready social mix. And for that reason, in the Finnish social housing, which is meant for people with low incomes, there are no actual income ceilings which makes also it possible to have a social mix within the social housing. I thank you all. Um, keep the conversation outside of this room. Uh, there will be another event at 1.15, organized by the World Family Organization together with our division, the Division for Inclusive Social Development. In which room, I mean? In this very same room. So if you want to come back, you have... Um, Hmm. about 30 minutes to have a drink, eat something, wash your hands, and uh, network. Thank you.